Hi YouTube and welcome to my channel. My name is Patrick. Today we're going to talk about the top Linux cybersecurity myths and what you really have to actually do to keep yourself safe. So with that being said, let's dig right in. So a lot of the discourse about Linux security that I see is people saying Linux is immune from malware. Linux doesn't get viruses. You don't have to worry about that stuff on Linux. And look, that just can't be true, and it isn't. I mean, look for example at in the past of macOS. In the early 2000s, people were like, oh yeah, macOS doesn't get viruses. macOS never gets malware. Fast forward 20 years to today, and yeah, there's lots of viruses and malware out there for Mac. Uh, so this whole notion that any system can be perfectly invulnerable and secure is just, just not true. So we're going to tackle a handful of myths here today. First, the myth of invulnerability, the difference between malware and software, and finally, do you really need an antivirus on Linux? Plus, I'll go on a little bonus rant at the end. So let's dig right into this, starting with the myth of invulnerability. People say, like I just said, Linux can't get viruses. And look, it definitely can. <laughs> like, I, I can prove it too. Look at one of my past videos where I set up a honeypot on the public internet. And lo and behold, within 12 hours, I had dozens of samples of Linux malware. Linux malware and Linux viruses are real and they're out there. But my point here is that nothing is invulnerable and that brings me on to my second point everything's vulnerable <laughs> uh, so people often say oh i i use open source bro i'm good i'm safe and that doesn't necessarily mean that you're safe for example look at the xz backdoor that came out a few months ago that was a targeted attack by a nation state actor that infiltrated the development of a critical utility that every linux distro relies on and it was only caught because, of, because an engineer at Microsoft was getting macro efficient with his resource utilization. And without that stroke of luck, frankly, that back door would have happened. And it's naive of us to think that this hasn't actually been successful. Right, so yes, it's great that we caught this and we stopped it, and that's a big open source success story. But now that the, the Pandora's box is open, we're going to see a lot more of these types of infiltrations. And just because you're using open source doesn't mean you're secure. Now, that's the whole, that's the whole espionage side of things. But there's another aspect to it, specifically the fact that even open source code has flaws. Like there, there's never ever going to be code written unless it's extremely trivial that won't have a flaw. That's just a fact. I mean, look at all the software ever written in all of history. And guess what? Every single one has flaws. And those flaws can often be exploited. Just because it's open source doesn't even mean that the fixes get applied any faster. I've crunched the numbers. If you compare the CVEs that come out for Windows to the CVEs for something like Fedora Linux, big surprise, it's my favorite. So Windows will get slightly more vulnerabilities than Linux, but the Linux vulnerabilities are slightly higher in severity. And if you average out the severity to the number of vulnerabilities, they come out about even. And when you measure the time it takes to patch one or the other, it's pretty much the same speed. So at the end of the day, open source and proprietary, which one's safer? Well, it's kind of a wash. And that brings me on to my third point. What's the difference between malware and software? Let me give you an example. Let's say I install a tool on my Linux server that gives me remote access. Uh, in that circumstance, that's a legitimate administration tool. But what if I installed that on a server that wasn't mine and that would give me access? Well, now all of a sudden it's malware and it's the exact same code used in the exact same way. The only difference between them is the intention behind it. Oftentimes, the difference between malware and software is not the code. It's the intention of how it's used. And here's, here's my big question. 
How's a computer supposed to measure intent? Like computers, they run code. They don't measure the intention behind your actions, at least not yet. But that's really the big question because you have to understand that there will always be malware because that malware is just legitimate software used for evil. <laughs> like, in the computer's perspective, it can't tell the difference. Okay, and number four, do you really need an antivirus on Linux? Well, that's a little bit of a myth and it goes both ways, but really it depends on your threat model. Now, is your Linux system serving up email and files for other computers in your network? Well, yeah, in that case, it probably needs an antivirus. Is it just a desktop that you use to browse YouTube? Well, then it probably doesn't need antivirus. But people often try to give this blanket explanation, a one-size-fits-all prescription, saying that you don't need antivirus on Linux at all. And when it comes to running workloads where the servers are juicy targets, yeah, you do need an antivirus. If you're just sitting at home though, you're your average home user, you're browsing YouTube, browsing Facebook, don't worry about the antivirus, just be smart about what you click. Now, if you're giving a Linux desktop or laptop to somebody who's not very tech savvy, in that circumstance, you may want to put an antivirus on it. But while we're on the subject, let me just say, I, for the life of me, cannot find a good antivirus for Linux. <laughs> like, so uh, here's, here's my threat model. Any, any server that I have that touches the public internet in any way has to have an antivirus. That's overkill, yes, but I'm a cybersecurity engineer. My shit's gonna be locked down. So every server I have that has the ability to reach out to the public internet has an antivirus on it. And my problem here is that I'm using Microsoft Defender on Linux. <laughs> I'm paying four bucks a month per server to have Microsoft Defender for Linux on my servers. <laughs> I just, I can't find a good antivirus. Like, if you, if you have any suggestions for me, please leave me a comment down below. I could really use some insight here. Like, what do you use for your Linux antivirus? I mean, Microsoft Defender is fine, but I'd prefer not to give Microsoft money, prefer not to give Microsoft my data, and I'd prefer something that's a little bit more heuristics and behavioral based rather than signature based. At the end of the day, though, an antivirus is not a magical solution, because this harkens back to what I just said. How is an antivirus supposed to tell the difference between a legitimate access tool and a malicious one, when the only difference is the intent behind it? So an antivirus isn't going to save you from everything. Really, if you want to be secure, you have to take a layered approach. That's what modern cybersecurity is all about, adding layers on layers and making the path through them a little bit like Swiss cheese. But an antivirus can be a meaningful layer of your protection, but at the end of the day, common sense and keeping your wits about you are going to be the biggest things that can keep you safe. And just to make things more complicated, my next point is, how do we define secure? Because the thing is, being secure means different things to different people. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, that's just the realistic look of how it is. Everybody has a different definition for what secure means for them. They have a different definition of what information they can make public and what information they want to keep private. And that's unique to every person. So there, I'm never going to be able to give you a one-size-fits-all cybersecurity recommendation besides the fact that you should do threat modeling. What is threat modeling? Basically, you write down what you're trying to protect, you write down what can be done to get access to it, and then you write down what you're doing to mitigate that. That's a very dumbs down version. If you want a more thorough video on threat modeling, definitely leave me a comment down below. I'd be happy to make one if there's interest. But my point is that your casual user at home is going to have a very different threat model than a sysadmin at a Fortune 500 company. Uh, that's just the nature of these things. There is no single definition for what is secure. It's much more of a spectrum. Uh, I'll give you an example. My threat model. 
Uh, I use Windows, Mac OS, Linux, iPad OS, iPhone. I use all these different tools, but each of them serves a different purpose. And each of those tools is designated on where they fall in my threat model. So on my Windows computer, I only enter information into it that's considered public knowledge. On my Mac OS computer, I put very limited personal information on it because I because it is more sensitive and easier to defend than Windows, but still I don't put everything on it. And then I have my cybersecurity research. That happens on a Cubes OS machine. If you don't know about Cubes OS, super cool project. Uh, but my point here is that I have these different systems with different levels of sensitivity and I've decided deliberately what information is on each one to match my threat model. All right, so at the end of the day, is Linux secure? It depends on what secure means to you. And I hate to give a cop-out answer, but like I just said, there is no one-size-fits-all security. Everybody has different levels of risk tolerance, everybody has different things they need to achieve, everybody has different information that they consider public or private. And yes, Linux can be secure, but it's not something where you open up the box and you're done, right? It's not you install Linux and you're done. That's not how it works. You have to sit there and be deliberate about what you're doing with it and where it falls in the spectrum of sensitivity. Bye.